CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Fort Lauderdale. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Hello ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Our um, president, Patty Tillett, is in London visiting with his family and our president-elect, Susan Kelly, is welcoming the streetcar, so it has devolved to me to be speaker of the house today. I'm Corlene Kraft. I'm a member of the Board of Governors and chair of the program committee. I would like to make our typical announcements, which is that our 32nd warning is uh, on our questions is to ask that you, although we realize that all of you are very scholarly and bright, let's demonstrate that by being succinct in the questions that we ask of our guests today. Um, was that applause? <laughs> Um, I would like to call your attention to our meeting next Friday, which is the last meeting of the summer. We have our typical hiatus in August, and it should be very interesting and timely and enlightening. We're having um, Stephen Wright, who's the acting administrator of uh, Bonneville Power, will be here, and it will be here at the MAC. I'd also like to draw your attention to the City Club website, which has past presentations and um, upcoming events and membership information. It's at PDX City, oh, pdxcityclub.org. Our member host today is uh, seated to the left of our guest, and that is um, Nikki Lynch. She's a member of the program committee, and she'll ask the first question. I wanted to also have the opportunity to recognize our sponsors who are very uh, helpful to us in, since we are a nonprofit organization and they are CH2M Hill, Providence Health Systems and Warehouser Company Foundation and they're underwriting this program today. Our speaker today is Ralph Shaw, and he's a well-known Northwest venture capitalist. He's with over 40 years of biz uh, experience in the securities business. He has a degree in public accounting from Hof Hofstra and a JD from NYU, which presumably makes him very good at making sure the numbers are legal. Uh, in 1980, he formed Shaw Management Company, which was an investment counseling firm, and in 83, he moved into the venture capital business, partnering with U.S. Bancorp. As a testament to the fact that his counsel is so widely sought, when I was looking at his biography, it, it, as I counted it up, it seems that he's serving on at least 11 boards of governors now, and his past board affiliations look like a who's who of uh, Northwest companies, many of whom have been capitalized by his organization. He's here to talk to us today about the risks and rewards inherent in the new economy, and will also explain to us what the new economy is. Um, I welcome Ralph Shaw. Thank you, Colleen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, the last time I addressed the City Club was in 1982, and uh, it was during the deepest recession, close to a depression, that uh, the state of Oregon had seen uh, since the 30s, and it was uh, because of the comments that I made at that presentation that the uh, U.S. Bank uh, came to us and, and said that they would provide us with whatever capital we needed to start Shaw Venture Partners and help small companies get started in the state of Oregon. So I thank the City Club because you made a big difference in my life, and I hope that we've made a fair difference in the life of a lot of Oregonians. Earlier this week, uh, Floyd Norris, who is a writer for the New York Times, asked the New York Times readers if they had remembered Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, Rutherford Hayes was president of the United States when Corning Glassworks last failed to pay a dividend to its common shareholders. That was in 1880, and that was only a few years after Corning came up with a specially shaped glass container for Thomas Alva Edison to be used in making light bulbs. Corning had begun to pay dividends in 1881, 
and it had never stopped, despite wars and depressions, until now. Corning, Floyd Norris remarked, is a victim of the greatest bubble of our time, the fiber optic craze. The lure of a wired nation with unlimited potential has led numerous companies to invest billions of dollars in fiber optic capacity, Mr. Norris said. He further went on. The majority of that money now appears to have been wasted. This week, Corning did more than eliminate its dividend. It announced plans to close one manufacturing plant that opened last year and another that was under construction. People who were hired last year were told that they were going to be laid off. So certain had Corning been that telecom demand for optical fibers and related components would continue to soar that the company had signed take or pay contracts with suppliers requiring Corning to buy components whether or not it needed them. Such contracts were totally unheard of until the last couple of years when the bubble mentality really took hold. Now, according to Floyd Norris, Corning is writing off that inventory because it knows it will never be able to sell it. Nor was Corning Glass alone in this environment. Cisco Systems, considered the epitome of the new economy, has erased more than $2 billion worth of its inventory with the stroke of a pen, and it has released 8,500 employees. Nortel, another blue chip telecom company, has announced its intentions to fire more than 30,000 workers, and yesterday announced that it was going to eliminate some $20 billion from its balance sheet due to losses in the most recent quarter. Lucent, once exalted as America's telecommunications research treasure, has been told by its banks that unless it sells its assets, pays down its debts, some dire events are likely to take place. Today they announced they were going to sell some of their private jets. In addition, as a result of this, the company has given pink slips to some 16,000 employees, and more will be coming. Motorola has let go 14,500 people, and JDS Uniphase, some 8,000. Last year, as James Glenn of the Dismal Scientist reminded us, the broad telecommunications industry accounted for over $400 billion in real gross domestic product. And that's about 4.5% of our nation's total. Just over one-third of the industry's real output was created by the manufacturing side of the industry whereas the services side accounted for something less than two-thirds. Mr. Glenn figures that the surge in telecom equipment added approximately 25 basis points to annualize real gross domestic product growth in each of the last two years. However, as he reported, the recent abrupt pullback in spending has swiftly shaved some 40 basis points from annualized real gross domestic product growth in the first quarter and it will most likely continue to weigh on what, is li what little is left of the economic expansion that we've had. Depending upon which expert you listen to, we are now using somewhere between 2.5% and 5% of all the fiber optic capacity that has been placed in the ground. Think of that, 25 to 5%. And I suspect that the tearing up of of Broadway here, which started here a couple days ago, just means more fiber optic capacity is going into downtown Portland. Meanwhile, advancing technology continues to enable more and more information to flow on existing fiber infrastructures. Today it is estimated that a single strand of fiber, one single strand of fiber, can take care of all the telephone calls in the United States. Resultingly, prices for in-place fiber capacity have reached subterranean levels. So it shouldn't be much of a surprise to learn that after spending close to $3 billion so far this year, and expecting to spend some $3.5 billion for the entire year, Metro Media Fiber Network 
which is one of the world's largest fiber optic carriers, is bleeding cash and may not make it through the year unless it can raise another $350 million of fresh capital. Metromedia Fiber Network has some $2,600,000 in long-term debt, and it enjoys a $2 billion investment from Verizon, the cellular carrier. The sharp slowdown that we've seen in telecommunications growth is not confined to lower prices due to increased supply relative to demand. In spite of the ubiquitous nature of email and internet messaging, overall internet traffic is beginning to slow. Think for the moment of how much time you could possibly spend in front of your computer monitor. Then consider that an estimated 68% of all American households now have a computer. With or without higher speed lines, how much more information can you absorb without replacing the time you spend in front of your computer monitor and replacing some of the time that you now spend in front of your television set, unless you are a business or a government utility. Now that isn't the whole reason, but it's sure a contributing factor to the, to the continuing demise of the dot-coms. Webmergers.com, a website, reported that in June of this year, some 53 internet companies bit the dust. One less than bit the dust at the same point in May, which was also one less than in April. In June of last year, some 17 internet companies shut their doors. But since January of 2000, at least 555 internet companies employing more than 150,000 workers have folded, with more than nine times as many companies shutting down in the first half of this year as in the same period of the year 2000. Remember that internet companies a year ago were just beginning to feel the pinch of the decline in funding that began in late March and accelerated throughout the year until it, the NASDAQ caused the worst loss in American pocketbooks in 29 years and effectively shut off the IPO and private equity funding sources. Of these failures, e-commerce, e-retailing, still accounts for nearly half of all the shutdowns to date. But the internet shakeout is beginning to spread to new sectors, such as internet consulting firms and startup uh, and providers of dial-up or digital subscriber line, DSL, internet access and web hosting services. The black cloud is now reaching application service providers and internet advertising specialists. Fewer internet-related companies and financially troubled telecommunications firms logically lead to less demand for computers and other electronics equipment. Thus, Sun Microsystems, a major supplier to both industries, reported yesterday that its revenues in its fiscal fourth quarter fell some 20% year to year. The company's losses after taking into account equity portfolio changes, acquisition costs, and other items total some $88 million. That's a loss of $88 million. A year ago in the fiscal fourth quarter, they reported profits of $720 million. That's a pretty decent change. Now, Sun Microsystems is not alone, of course. Yesterday, the Gardner Group announced that shipments of personal computers in the first half of the year fell some 2%. And Microsoft also yesterday warned that its results during the summer are going to be negatively affected by, quote, very soft to flat worldwide demand for PCs. And as night follows day, demand for the components that are used to make computers is also declining. The normally bullish Semiconductor Industry Association is now saying that the slowdown in the semiconductor industry may be the biggest ever, hitting 20% or worse decline from a year ago. The SIA said shipments of semiconductors in May were down almost 25% from May 2000, and average selling prices were down nearly 12%. This is the new economy. Declining revenues in most industries can usually be traced mainly to reduced unit demand. But in the high technology industries, there are often other culprits afoot. 
They are called product obsolescence and intensifying price competition. Illustrating these phenomena, Jack Robertson wrote in Electronic Buyers News this Monday, less than eight weeks after launching an aggressive double data rate SDRAM pricing campaign, Micron Technology has forced its competitors to follow suit. <coughs> Top of the line, SDRAM is now selling for less than $2 on the spot market, almost exactly the same price as single data, re data rate DRAMs they are designed to replace. Fred Waddle, who is the director of sales for Micron's computer and consumer group, said that production costs for these double data rate DRAMs are virtually the same as they are for a single rate DRAM, so why not cut the price? Unfortunately, as you might have read earlier this week, Hynix, which is the Korean-based manufacturer of semiconductors that was located down, or is located down in Eugene, announced that it was going to close its doors for the next six months. And Fujitsu, which has a facility making semiconductors, DRAMs out in Gresham, said, that it too was not ready to play in this game, and they were cutting their production capacity to somewhere in the vicinity of 20% from the 60% that are currently operating at. The reason is that Hynix used to be called Hyundai Semiconductor. It's 64 megabit DRAM technology, which is older technology than the Micron technology, is producing DRAMs, which are selling for something like 80 to 90 cents earlier this week. 80 to 90 cents, that's down from $9 in February, and $34 when those chips were introduced four years ago. Tough to make a living these days. The company said that it was going to spend $150 million to build 128 megabit DRAMs. But the 128 megabit DRAM chips, again, using older technology, technology, are now selling for $1.74 a unit, down from $17.20 last August. I suggest you question whether or not $150 million will be well spent producing an obsolete chip. So as I said yesterday, Hynix announced that it was going to shut down for six months, and there are some 600 jobs in Eugene that depend upon that company. A similar scenario is playing out in much of the new economy, and it shines a bright spotlight on the risks of blind devotion to seeking out the so-called new economy investments. What is a new economy? Well, the Congressional Office of uh, Technology Assessment describes high technology firms as those that are engaged in the design, development, and introduction of new products and innovative manufacturing processes, or both, through the systematic application of scientific and technical knowledge. The Congressional Office also points out that high technology firms typically use state-of-the-art techniques, and in terms of quantifiable resources, such firms devote a high proportion of expenditures to research and development, and they employ a high proportion of scientific, technical, and engineering personnel. The term high technology, for most people, suggests rapid revenue growth, superior and protected profit margins, productivity enhancement, and a high degree of uniqueness. Yet these characteristics are often absent in many of the companies we consider to be part of the high technology industries. There's no question that it takes extraordinary skills to design and manufacture semiconductors, computers, and computer peripherals. But the rewards from product development in these areas frequently are fleeting. Few electronic devices are as complex as memory chips. Nonetheless, there are several companies possessing very smart engineers who can quickly duplicate the advantages of the latest entries into the market. As a result, in spite of the, quote, high technology, and quote, nature of memory chip design, this industry suffers from the same headaches that afflict such industries as steel, energy, and chemicals. In other words, price competition and highly cyclical profit margins. I suggest to you that many of the so-called high-technology companies are more akin to commodities producers 
than they are to the possessors of patented or proprietary products, just as Hynex. This conclusion, I suggest too, should be applied to a large portion of the so-called new economy. We have already seen what it means if there are too many makers of optical fiber, or essentially duplicative websites. Telecommunications hotels sound very sexy, until you realize that anyone with money can call up a telecom engineering firm and pay for an installation that is no different than the dozens of others populating the landscape. And when your only advantage is access to capital, as opposed to a defensible technology, you should be aware that there are lots of venture capital investors anxious to capture your assumed fast revenue growth and promised high profit margins. Then, within a relatively short period of time, and frequently before you can regain your entire investment, the characteristics of commodity-type businesses pervade your high-technology investments. And that means lower returns on investment and the need to pay very close attention to costs. Perhaps that's the reason that the U.S. Department of Labor noted that except for three highly defense-related industries, that's aerospace, navigation and guidance instruments, and ordnance and accessories manufacturing, employment in high technology manufacturing industries as a group actually declined 1% over the 1986 to 1996 period. Moreover, the Department of Labor suggests that that high technology group will see employment decline over the next 10 years, 96 to 2006, by an additional 1%. Employment in most of the 25 high-tech manufacturing industries has and is projected to decline, and this is the pattern that we've seen in most manufacturing industries. The Department of Labor has noted that a decline in, for in manufacturing is forecast for computer and office equipment manufacturing, and that's an industry that many of us regard as having begun the high-tech revolution in the 70s and the 80s and is at the core of the new economy. Moreover, the Department of Labor's expectation is that on the only high-tech manufacturing industries with employment growth, which will be faster than the economy overall, are health-related drugs and medical equipment instruments and supplies. Now, these forecasts seem to be somewhat different than those that were making headlines just a few months ago. For example, the Gardner Group, a market research firm, in January 2000 predicted that by 2004, some seven and a third trillion dollars a year in global transactions would flow through the internet. That's 70 percent, the equivalent of 70 percent of the U.S. economy. But in line with today's more cautious thinking, that firm has revised its projections downward by more than one and a third trillion dollars. Lawrence Shu, who is Gardner's research director, said several factors led to the downward revision, particularly the global economic slowdown. Ms. Shu particularly noted projections made by Data Resources and WIFA, which is the old Wharton Economic Forecasting Group, and together they make up one of the world's largest economic consulting firms. And that group has suggested that the current downturn in the economy will slice some 16% from worldwide sales transactions over the next four years. In addition, Ms. Shu expressed concern that Europe and Asia may really not follow quickly on the heels of the United States in embracing e-business due to a laundry list of cultural and re regulatory obstacles. Speaking with Bob Tedeschi of the New York Times, Ms. Shu expressed concern that the so-called data standards looms large because most industries are far from agreeing on a common data format for transmitting data. Consumer goods manufacturers and grocery stores have to agree on a common internet shorthand for every item they sell. For example, you take a 12-ounce bottle of Pert shampoo. Uh, should the code be, you know, 12 B P R T, or should it be P R T 12 O Z B, and should the shipping date read 03.26.01, or 
or should it be 3 slash 26 slash 01? After listening to this, Mr. Tedeschi concluded, until these types of questions are decided, each company is going to have to go ahead and customize its data formats for its business partners, and therefore any efficiency gleaned from the internet transaction quickly has disappeared. Or to put it another way, Leah Knight, who was the author of the January 2000 forecast for Gardner, said, it seems today that internet sales transactions are less significant than what leads up to them. Although Ms. Knight has dismissed the substantial reductions in her January 2000 predictions, those predictions, and it was similar naive uh, optimism, that led billions and billions of dollars to be spent in pursuit of immediate gratification from investments in the new economy. As David Simons, who was uh, the managing director of Digital Video Investments, which is an institutional research firm, said just this spring, the subtext of all these projections was that somehow the internet business models were far superior to what they had replaced, that they were the most fantastic thing since Dell and Gateway invented direct selling of PCs. But the business models were not revolutionary, Mr. Simon went on, and there will always be so much competition that for most players, at best it will be a nice business, not a great one. At this point, I'm sure you're no longer wondering why the new economy or dot-com bubble burst. Nor I'm sure are you confused as to what will happen to the approximately 12,000 surviving dot-com firms, many of which are living on their last round of financing. Indeed, I'd frankly be a little surprised if there wasn't some uh, hidden sense of satisfaction as you read those stories of dot-com multimillionaires who are just now buying their first sa shaving equipment with their unemployment checks. But as Larry Downs, a business strategist, wrote in the USA Today, the new economy is not dead. The bad earnings reports, layoffs and bankruptcies, of course, are very real. Hundreds, if not thousands, of startups built on little more than wishful thinking and easy money are dead or are dying away as well they should. Yet at the same time, real progress is being made. Mr. Downs went on. The genius of Mao Zedong's revolution in China, it has been said, was how he built the Red Army. Going from village to village, he recruited one farmer at a time until one day he had an overwhelming force. The internet will change everything, but not in a few months or even in a few years. In the new industrial revolution, it will be the overall campaign, not the early skirmishes, that makes the difference. A similar conclusion was reached by Warden School marketing professor George Day. Based upon research into dozens of old economy shakeouts, from the invention of the railroad to the advent of personal computers, and summarized in Knowledge at Wharton, an online news magazine, Professor Day holds that this new economy shakeout is not very much different than what we saw when we had 5,000 railroads and several thousand automobile companies back in the 20s. Far too many players come in, then there's a lot of excitement, high visibility, there really are low barriers to entry, and all of those conditions applied to today's new economy. It was like every shakeout we have studied Professor Day said, just a lot faster, magnified by free-flowing capital, incubators, and a tendency for everyone to converge on the same business model. The critical error committed by most dot-com startups was to misidentify the type of market they were entering. Professor Day draws what he feels is a key distinction between a breakthrough and a reformed market. Breakthrough applications create new products or services that would be impossible without the new technology. They give rise to totally new industries. These situations are pretty rare. Less than 10% of the products are truly new to the world products, including, for example, television sets, serography, and artificial fiber. 
By contrast, reformed applications, while they might enable cost reductions or other improvements, really don't change the basic functioning and the purpose of the existing markets. Professor Day offers a cautionary tale from the recent biotechnology phenomenon. Many industry analysts believe these small startups in biotech would eventually replace the pharmaceutical giants. However, biotechnology was seen as a breakthrough market when it was actually a reformed one. While the new technology improved the drug discovery process, it didn't cause a wholesale redefinition of the pharmaceutical business model. As a result, most biotechnology startups, lacking expertise in sales, in marketing, in regulatory processes, distribution channels, and management, have been acquired or have failed outright. And the same message holds true for the dot-coms. The belief that they were entering a breakthrough market was the cause of their downfall. Misdiagnosing that market has led to three persistent myths that I'm sure that you've heard about, about the sources of competitive advantage in online markets. Let me go over those three myths. First myth, if you're the first mover, you're going to dominate. Well, that's true in a breakthrough market, but it's certainly not true in a reformed market. Business-to-business -business hubs, for one, have discovered that their greatest competition is not other business-to-business -business hubs, but existing ways of doing business. For instance, first mover advantage versus another business-to-business -business exchange is truly meaningless if customers prefer to keep their in-place system of buyers, distributors, and others. Myth number two, behavior will change quickly once you introduce the new technology. In reformed markets, however, customers are really pretty slow to abandon older systems that do work, even if they're not optimally efficient. For example, internet banks are finding out the hard way that consumers are reluctant to give up their ATMs and move their household banking online. Myth number three. Non-traditional pricing structures will be readily accepted in the marketplace. Professor Day highlights the waning of transaction fees by business-to-business -business exchanges. Those were a pattern where the business-to-business -business exchange charged sellers 2 to 5 percent of gross sales as payment for matching them up with buyers. Competition, however, is quickly cutting these fees to marginal or even lower cost and exchange operators are transforming their pricing models into much more familiar forms in order to survive. As an illustration, Ventro, which was a pioneer in the transaction fee approach, has now become a software and service company. Professor Day concluded, successful incumbent companies will have blended their traditional scale, scope, and resource advantages with the reforming potential of the internet. They have respected and visible brand names, the ability to spread marketing costs across both channels and, le and leverage with suppliers. In a reformed market, the incumbent, in other words, the existing companies, has a lot of the chips, the brand name, the resources, the fact that most people don't want to exclusively transact business over the internet. And so established firms in reformed markets have lots of advantages and they are exercising them. <laughs> blind enthusiasm, or in today's economic malaise, blind pessimism, has always led to a painful reversal once participants recognize the folly in not thinking for themselves. This experience is repeated over and over and over again because each time we believe that this time it is different. But don't consider yourself not to have been forewarned of this frailty. How many people here remember Hans Christian Andersen's story of the Emperor's New Clothes? Let me repeat this for you, just as an example. Once upon a time, there lived an emperor whose only worry in life was to dress in elegant clothes. He changed clothes almost every hour, and he loved to show them off to his, off to his people. Word of the emperor's refined habits spread over his kingdom and beyond. 
and two scoundrels who had heard of the Emperor's vanity decided to take advantage of it. They introduced themselves at the gates of the palace with a scheme in mind. We are two very good tailors, and after many years of research, we have invented an extraordinary method to weave a cloth so light and so fine that it looks invisible. As a matter of fact, it is invisible to anyone who is too stupid and too incompetent to appreciate his quality. <laughs> Convincing the emperor, the scoundrels were told, just tell us what you need to get started and we'll give it to you. The scoundrels asked for a loom, silk, gold thread, and then pretended to begin working. The emperor thought that his money was quite well spent because in addition to getting a new and extraordinary suit, he would discover which of his subjects were ignorant and which were incompetent. And a few days later, he went ahead and he called the old and wise prime minister, who was considered by everyone to be a man with great common sense. Go and see how the work is progressing, the emperor said, and come back and let me know. The prime minister was welcomed by the two scoundrels. We're almost finished, but we need a lot more gold thread. Here, Excellency, admire the colors, feel the softness. The old man bent over the loom and tried to see the fabric that was not there. He felt cold sweat on his forehead. I can't see anything, he thought. If I see nothing, that means I'm stupid, or worse, incompetent. What a marvelous fabric, he said then. I'll certainly tell the emperor. Finally, the emperor received the announcement that the two tailors had come to take all the measurements that were needed to sew his new suit. Come in, the emperor ordered. And even as they bowed, the two scoundrels pretended to be holding a large roll of fabric. Here it is, your highness, the result of our labor, the scoundrel said. We have worked day and night, but at last the most beautiful fabric in the world is ready for you. Look at the colors and feel how fine it is. Of course, the emperor didn't see any colors and could not feel any cloth between his fingers. He panicked and he felt like fainting. But when he realized that no one could not, no one knew that he could not see the fabric, he felt better. Nobody could find out that the emperor was stupid or incompetent. And the emperor didn't know that everybody else around him thought and did the very same thing. Your Highness, the scoundrel said, you'll have to take off your clothes to try on the new ones. The two scoundrels draped the new clothes on him and then held up a mirror. The emperor was embarrassed, but since none of his bystanders seemed to be, he felt pretty relieved. Yes, this is a beautiful suit, and it looks very good on me, the emperor said, trying to look comfortable. You've done a fine job. Accepting his advisor's urgings to show off his beautiful new clothes to his subjects, the emperor summoned his carriage, and a ceremonial parade was formed. All the people had gathered in the main square, pushing and shoving to get a better look. Applause welcomed the regal procession. Everyone wanted to know how stupid or incompetent his or her neighbor really was. But as the emperor passed, a strange murmur rose from the crowd. Everyone said loud enough for the others to hear, look at the emperor's new clothes. Aren't they beautiful? They all try to conceal their disappointment at not being able to see the clothes. And since nobody was willing to admit his own stupidity and incompetence, they all behaved as the two scoundrels had predicted. A child, however, who had no important job and could only sing things as his eyes showed them to them, went up to the carriage. The emperor is naked, he said. Fool, his father reprimanded, running after him. Don't you talk nonsense. He grabbed his child and took him away, but the boy's remark, which had been heard by the bystanders, was repeated over and over again until everyone cried, the boy is right, the emperor is naked, it's true. The emperor realized that the people were right, but he could not admit to them. He thought it better to continue the procession under the illusion that anyone who couldn't see his clothes was either stupid or incompetent and he stood stiffly in his carriage, while behind him a page held his imaginary mantle. Does that sound like the new economy? Thank you.
I may ask where the nearest bridge is. Um, our first question will be from Nikki Lynch, our member host, and I'd like to invite anyone who would has a question to please start lining up to forbid or to uh, get away from the dreaded dead air that we will be experiencing if we don't get someone over there. Thank you. Well, I guess my roundabout question is, given your story, are the venture capitalists the scoundrels that are weaving the naked cloth? <laughs> I would suggest the uh, venture capitalists you know, are more like the emperor, who saw, who saw things in the presentations made by the entrepreneurs who were seeking money that didn't exist. We've been planning for a lot of growth in this area. I think some of that has been based on our concept that this kind of new economy was going to fuel a lot more folks moving to this area. Do you think that there will be any population impacts from your analysis? Well, I think the first question I would, uh, let, let, me, let me respond by asking a question. How many other communities have decided that high technology is there, you will be their success in the future? Many. I want to guess it's all. How many communities have said biotechnology is going to be the keys to employment growth and improvement in standard of living? I want to guess all. So what we say and what we're looking for, we have to recognize is being looked for by everybody. And that's what I was trying to point out has occurred in this new economy. Is the internet something that's important? Does it really make a difference? Absolutely. But when you have 300 sites, websites that offer the same products, it's unlikely that all 300 will be successful. And if you have that kind of competition, it may very well be possible that nobody will be successful. In, uh, in the early 80s, when I first went into the venture capital business, the, uh, the whole idea was, uh, the, the, the theme at that moment was personal computers. And everybody went around looking, for example, to find a company that made disk drives. And as a result, by 1986, there were 150 companies making disk drives. Not a one was profitable. So I would suggest that when we take a look at what our goals are, that we have to be realistic. And we cannot assume that everyone else is stupid and we're the only ones who see the emperor's new clothes. Heather Command, City Club member. I have a question um, in regards to your, your business model suggestion that that was the reason of the failure, that it was a misdiagnosis. Um, along those lines, I think that perhaps expectations were what fueled the growth of the industry and have also been undermining the industry. How might you suggest expectations reach an appropriate level to be able to continue the industry into what it is going to be eventually and yet sustain itself through the period of, of poor diagnosis? Well, I, let, let me uh, suggest that, that uh, again, we, we live in a, in a global world, I mean a global uh, in, uh, you know, environment in which everybody can get the same information. One of the, the great advantages of the internet is if I would like to read a newspaper that's published in India, all I have to do is go to my computer and I can read that newspaper. And I suggest to you that people in India may be reading the New York Times over the internet or maybe even the Portland Argonian, because it's there if they want to read it. So what is uh, the, the forecasts that you're talking about, once they become well recognized, are going to be adopted across the world by people who say this is an opportunity that they would like to pursue. So it doesn't mean that the industry doesn't grow. It doesn't mean that, for example, that, that memory chips or DRAMs, which I referred to earlier, are going away. On the contrary, they're now so inexpensive that your computer will come with 256 megabits of memory, whereas last year, 128 megabits was probably the maximum that most people were offered, and many of the computers were sold with 64 megabits. 
because the price is so much lower. However, the manufacturers aren't making any money out of it. I mean, I can't believe that Hyundai or Hynix is, will, is legitimately going to spend $150 million to make an obsolete product which has declined in, in price by 90% in the last 11 months. I know they're not going to do that. They can't do that because Hynix is only in business today at the mercy of their banks. So as long as managements are are uh, naive and believe that their decisions are only going to be uh, pursued, or that their kind of decisions will only be pursued within their own organization and not in the rest of the world, we're going to see continued waste of money, burning up of billions and billions of dollars. Don't forget, in the stock market, it's estimated that something like $4 trillion has been lost in the last 18 months in declining stock prices. Four trillion dollars. That's 40% of our gross domestic product for the year. So I would suggest that, that one has to always ask the question, how easy it is, is it for other people to compete in my marketplace? And what about the people who are already established in these markets? That's what Professor Day said. That's what we need to do. Do I think that we're going to see growth of the Internet? Absolutely. Do I, if, if you have 97.5% of the fiber optics lying in the ground and it's unlit, it's, in other words, it's not being operated, I'm going to guess that somebody's going to try to figure out a way to use that and tie it so that you and I and corporations and, and government agencies and nonprofits can basically get very high-speed transmission of data and maybe video and and communication over the internet. It will happen. I can't tell you who's going to do it, but it's too logical not to see it happen. Fiber to the home will occur because you have all of that capacity out there and somebody will see you can make some money out of it. Let me use as an example Iridium. You know the Iridium, the satellite, the telecommunic, you know, that made phones that would look like a briefcase, you know, and you had to carry it around in the Sahara in case you were visiting the Sahara. Uh, but you can make a phone call for $8 a minute, you know, if you were there. Well, you know, before you knew it, they were out of business. It didn't take them much more than a year, and they were insolvent. And they were going to shoot down or basically let all their satellites burn up in the atmosphere because it's just considered to be uh, junk floating around in space, and they had to get rid of it. But then some companies found out that they could buy that whole system for virtually nothing. Not the billions of dollars that were spent, but virtually nothing. Because in bankruptcy, that's what it was worth. So Motorola came out with a smaller phone. And now Iridium is operating. And you can now make a phone call for a dollar and a half a minute. You have a smaller phone, and it gives you some opportunity. Same thing will happen with the internet. Same thing will happen with the fiber optics in the ground. Same thing will happen with these very fast, very large capacity DRAMs. I can't tell you when. I can tell you, though, it will happen. Hi, Ralph. Joella Worlin, club member. Say something about demographics and the effect of the um, aging of the population on the growth of in, in, or even the potential growth in these areas? I think that's, you know, again, here's, a, here's a, a subject that is perhaps the most crucial, most important subject that anybody in business or anybody uh, running any kind of organization needs to be aware of. The population of the United States is growing at about nine-tenths of one percent per annum. Half of the population is immigration, and or population growth, and half of, the popu half of that immigration is illegal immigration. Without immigration, the United States would be growing at less than a half of one percent per year in terms of population. It takes something like 2.1 children per family to maintain a stable population. You know, in Italy, the birth rate is 1.6. In Germany, it's like 
In the Scandinavian countries, certainly the Scandinavian countries, it's 1.3. If you extrapolate all of these trends in 100 years, there are no more Italians, there are no more Germans, there are no more Russians, there are no more English, there are no more Scandinavians. In the United States, if you took the 25 to 45 year age bracket, it's declining. The number in the 25 to 45 year age bracket is lower in 2005 than it was in 2000. And then if you break down that age bracket and you say, well, how about those who are well-educated and those who come from uh, nuclear families and have the ability to spend uh, money on average with what, we, what the previous generation spent? And what you find out is that that part of the population is declining even more substantially. And maybe the 30 to 40 year old age bracket could be down by as much as 20% in that bracket. So those are the people who buy their new homes, first homes. Those are the people who buy their first new cars, furniture, obviously clothing, that travel. So when you look at the economy as a whole, demographics play a major role. Now on the other hand, what's the fastest growing group? Fastest growing group is the 80 and over age bracket. So that's a consideration. But that group is very small. The real fastest growing group that's meaningful to all of us is the baby boomer. And you take a look at the baby boomer, and the, baby, the front edge of the baby boom is now about 53 years of age. And I suggest you think through this. How many had children, how many of you at 53 still had children in school? It's just about the time your kids are getting out of college or have gotten out of college. How much does it cost to send somebody to college these days? $5,000? $10,000? I know. <laughs> I know. I have two beautiful daughters here who have chosen two of the most expensive schools in the United States. <laughs> and just think, if you had a child in school, a private college, and you were paying forty dollars to $45,000 a year with all the expenses of clothing and travel and the like, how does it feel when they get out of school and they go to work? and all of a sudden you have $45,000 after tax that you can now spend. Go on a cruise ship and you know where it's being spent. Take a look at all the cars on the road and count the Geos versus the Mercedes or the high-end SUVs. That's where it's being spent. Count the second homes that are being built. Go down to Palm Springs. So demographics are really, really important. But as you look at that, be careful. Because if you're in the supermarket business, there's no growth. There's no growth. Nine-tenths of one percent in terms of more people. And the older you are, the less food you buy. You may buy better food, or it may cost you more, because you go to different restaurants. But the quantity of food isn't any greater. In fact, it's less. And maybe that's why what we're seeing across the United States in terms of agriculture is farmers going out of business, whether they be people who grow cherries or wheat or soybeans. So I would, I, you know, briefly, I believe that focusing on, on uh, demographics is a really important subject, really important idea. It's a fascinating fascinating science and what you come across is you realize that the population bomb is over it's gone it's not here it may be there it may be here in india and it may be in parts of africa but it isn't in western europe and it isn't in the united states peter pope city club member uh do you think it's possible that the demise of the, in other words, the amount of capital and everything that's been lost in internet and high-tech related investments is offset and maybe uh, so that we don't end in such a gloomy note. 
that in the increased productivity of, of other industries by the use of some of these tools has more than made up for the capital we've lost in the, in the, in the Internet? Well, you know, I, I mean, I, let, let me, you know, I'm not trying to be so overly pessimistic, you know, you know, but there's no question in my mind that if we spend, you know, $4 trillion more wisely, we would have even better productivity. I think the question is whether or not we're seeing productivity growth, and what, do we, what kind of risk do we need to take to in order to accomplish that? And the answer is that we have seen productivity growth, and certainly we would not have seen the growth of the Internet. We would not see the growth or the enhancement of computer products and, and the peripherals. Uh, we wouldn't be able to pay uh, you know, five cents or four and a quarter cents per minute on long distance if we hadn't put all this money into uh, expanding our long distance capacity. There really is a, di a direct advantage. In many ways, it's a cost advantage to us more than it is a productivity advantage. In other words, uh, if you took long distance and, and went back 15 years and you had to pay 80 or 90 cents a minute for long distance, and today you can get long distance from Costco and one of those you know, calling cards for four and a quarter cents. Wow, that's a big difference. Does that enable you to call people that you might not have spoken to before? Absolutely. Would it have happened if we didn't have so much increase in capacity uh, of long-distance carriers uh, so that you now had incredible competition? No, no. Does that really increase productivity? Well, it does in the sense that we can now make these calls and, and do business you know, better more often, e more easily than we did before. Does it make a big difference in terms of productivity of long distance lines? Yeah, you know, you know, to some extent. But I think the real difference is in terms of what, what it gives to the individual consumer in terms of being able to make money go further. That's productivity too, that's leverage. So I, I would answer you in the sense that I think the answer, I would agree that it does enhance productivity. It has enhanced productivity. It has given us the opportunity to, to buy things and do things which are much, uh, which in the past we weren't able to do. Uh, could it have been done better? Of course. How do you know which one you should have backed? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answer. Without taking a risk, you're never going to make any progress. And that's what we did. We took risks, but a lot of people poured all their capital into things without really thinking. Let me, let me finish up by giving you one insight. The National Venture Capital Association uh, has its annual convention in Washington, D.C. And a year ago, uh, the, the uh, managing director of the National Venture Capital Association very proudly got up and, and uh, welcomed everybody to the forum that year. And he said that the business had become so efficient that from the time a business plan was presented to a venture capitalist to the time that that entrepreneur received a commitment for funding was now down to two weeks. Now, I'm going to suggest to you, or ask you a question. When you're talking about breakthrough technology that theoretically nobody else knows about, do you think you can understand that and make a financial decision in two weeks? I can't. But that's what the average time it took for a venture capitalist to make a decision. Is that a productive use of assets? I'll leave that for you to answer.